hello. Thank you for joining the Center for Learning Health System Sciences for our inaugural impact seminar. Good afternoon. My name is Brian Maurer and I'll be your MC. I'm the operations and research coordinator for CLHSS or class as some of us call it here. And part of my role involves coordinating the education component. A few ground rules before we get started today and to set up some expectations. The seminar will be recorded and posted on our website. Following the presentation, we invite you to raise your hand or type questions in the Q&A. In addition to general Q&A, please feel free to ask Dr. Harley questions about the topic area. And in particular, questions exploring the many facets and dimensions of the impact that these ideas, technologies and practices have on learning health systems. And with that, I will turn it over to Genevieve to introduce our speaker and the seminar series. Hi everyone, it's a distinct pleasure uh, to be here and to welcome you all to our inaugural uh, seminar series, IMPACT. Um, it's exciting to bring everyone together and in particular to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Christopher Harley. Um, really looking forward um, to this series and also a monthly dialogue. Um, and this is gonna be one of several activities that we'll continue to have to advance our community around learning health system sciences. I'm really excited in particular uh, to introduce Chris, who is an amazing colleague. And um, really, uh, I think when I first met him, um, learning about him as uh, somebody that did a lot of work in health policy at the intersection of IT, and now seeing his role continue to expand really into research informatics, I'm really excited to hear about his perspectives. He is a professor of surgery, uh, sorry, whoops, I'm a professor of surgery. He is a professor of health outcomes in biomedical informatics at University of Florida. He also serves as the chief research information officer at the University of Florida Health. And his research really focuses on the design, adoption, use, and value of um, health IT, and really specifically around understanding how health IT related uh, or mediated communication tools really affect the consumers of that, the patient, um, how providers make decisions and their behavior. Um, and his research portfolio really is around dissemination and implementation um, and specifically um, a lot of work around behavioral economics. And he really has a very successful funding track record uh, through NIH, AHRQ, industry sponsorship as well. So really excited to hear about his talk today, which is entitled Building Health Data Services for Data Sciences and Artificial Intelligence, Intelligence Research Impact. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Genevieve. I appreciate the warm welcome. It's, it's exciting to be here and uh, speak with everyone today. I uh, will have, I'm excited that this seminar is intended to leave good time for discussion and I will do my best to leave that time and Brian will stop me as needed because I'm looking forward to getting feedback and hearing what folks uh, have to say about the things that, that I talk about. So I'm gonna share my screen now. And this talk is one that, or a variation of one that I've been giving uh, for the last four or five months at, at a lot of different places. And it really brings together a lot of the things that I've been thinking about and we've been thinking about at the University of Florida and the University of Florida Health over the last couple of years around how we build up data infrastructure, people infrastructure and processes to better serve data out in support of research, translational research in particular and learning health systems research. I won't spend much time talking about my own background or the research program that I lead, but I will just give you a little bit of a context. As Genevieve said, I've worked sort of at the intersection now for a little while of health services research and biomedical informatics. <clears throat> We've worked on a number of different problems and challenges around things like communicating and assessing risk, in particular in the diabetes space. We've uh, spent in the most recent years a lot of time thinking about clinical decision support implementation for chronic pain care. And more recently, as a CRIO, I've become really interested in 
uh, more about data services and collecting and validating real world data in support of research and, and how we do that organizationally. So I've been a, a chief research information officer now for about two and a half years at University of Florida Health. It's almost perfectly coincident with COVID. And this is sort of in a nutshell what that job entails. So on a day-to-day -day basis, people come to me and say, you know what, I have an idea. These are researchers, right? These are clinical researchers, health services researchers, implementation scientists. I just need some data from Epic or, or maybe a monitor or a machine that's plugged into the health system. And I know it's there because I, I saw it go in or I'm not a clinician, but a clinician told me it went in. Uh, or, or they may say, you know what? I have, a, I have a machine learning model or I have this data science risk assessment tool of some sort. All I need is the Epic team to implement it. And I know it's going to reap lots of benefits in terms of, of research output, in terms of clinical care improvements. And so this is one side of the bridge and, and that I span on a day-to-day -day basis. And over here on the other side, as a member of our health systems IT organization, I get to work with a fantastic group of IT staff, our CIO and, and 500 or more other people in the IT organization who say, yes, we're an academic health institution. I really want to help. Uh, but you know, the data that go into the EHR, they're really messy and sometimes they're really big and really complex and you know, they're not collected for research. Or they say, you know, uh, I, I hear you that that would be really cool if we could put that new decision support tool into the system, but research and operational goals, they're not always the same. And, and so how do we bridge that? And, and that's really at the crux of what being a CRIO is, at least at the University of Florida Health. And so in this talk, sort of, I wanna stage the context of this seemingly endless demand uh, for real world data, as well as this incredible hype and interest in new technologies, data science, artificial intelligence, and ask, you know, how do we build and support diverse and high impact research teams as academic health centers? Centers very much like we have here at University of Florida, and I think you have at the University of Minnesota. So how do we really build those teams, support those teams? And then as a, an IT organization or as a service unit to this system, how do we design and lead better teams? So the people, the data and the IT infrastructure, as well as service processes in a learning health system. So why, why, why do I think this probably applies to you all as much as it applies to our organization? I think most everyone on this call probably is either a data service provider or a customer. We are either working to generate or curate real world data or other health data in support of research, or we're consuming it in our own research programs. We are acquiring data, using data, oftentimes real world data in support of research. So real world health data, data that is naturally generated off of our healthcare systems, it was proliferating even before COVID. And then COVID happened, and it seems like the demand and the interest in real data to address real health care delivery, public health and population health problems just proliferated even further. And we're also in this really interesting time where there's an incredibly tight labor market for data science, informatics, and IT expertise. And so this has created uh, tons of challenges, but tons of opportunity for delivering up data and having impact on, on health and healthcare. At the same time, we're starting to see, I believe, artificial intelligence, other machine learning approaches, the methods are becoming commoditized. And with that, there's more and more pressure to implement, not to just build models and deliver a, a really high AUC, but, but put data science tools and implementation into implementation. And with those comes all sorts of interesting uh, questions about bias, harm, drift, uh, sustainability, and overall how we govern these, these tools. And frankly, we're still figuring all of this out in terms of barriers and facilitators. The informatics literature has been thinking about this for some time now. And uh, this is the clinical research informatics literature. This comes out of lots of CTSA organizations. We're still figuring out how we serve up data in a learning health system environment, how we govern, how we prioritize, which tools and common data models to use. How do we accommodate users of varying skill sets? How do we coordinate across stakeholders and how do we engage, communicate? Uh, and then data quality becomes a huge, huge question, something we could talk about more as, as we go today. How do we validate the quality of the data that we're, that we're delivering and we're using? When again, it's not created for research, it's created quite often for healthcare delivery, but we want to use it for research discovery. 
So in this talk, I will give some local context just to give you a sense of the University of Florida and the University of Florida Health. I'll talk a little bit about our integrated data repository organization. That's our data services, research data services unit in the organization that, that I have the pleasure of leading. And then a couple of things that we're trying to do to scale our impact by increasing emphasis on the data generation as well as the implementation and, and doing service process improvement, which I'd love to get feedback on. These are some discussion questions that are sort of a mix of some of my own questions as well as ones that, that Brian and team delivered to me. So we'll keep these in mind as we go and, and we'll bring the slide back up near the end. So organizational context, uh, University of Florida has embarked on its artificial intelligence initiative. This is a $70 million, really more than that, partnership with the NVIDIA Corporation, where we basically uh, were donated a giant supercomputer that can do amazing computation. And then we made a commitment at the university to hire 100 new faculty throughout the university who do artificial intelligence or do data science more broadly in their work, in their education, in their uh, scholarly activities. So UF seeks to be the leading force in AI-powered research that revolutionizes the way we work, play, and live our lives. UF Health, so this is our academic health center. Again, we've got a large land grant university that is the University of Florida, and then UF Health includes our healthcare delivery services and systems, as well as our health colleges, medicine and nursing, vet med, pharmacy, public health and health professions, dentistry. And so we span three campuses in Florida with a variety of clinical research and educational activities. And within our health colleges, we're hiring, we've now up to 26, but we'll be hiring 32 of those 100 AI faculty members. We have three not-for-profit health hospital systems across those three campuses. Uh, the UF health colleges do over $400 million a year in research awards. And the data infrastructure that I talked about is called our integrated data repository, which has data on over a million patients and over a billion facts and growing rapidly. At UF Health today, what does AI look like? Many, many successes, and probably just like at your university, and I know we're collaborating on many together, but many successes in using real world data sources and AI or machine learning as well with our high performance computing. So we have great teams who are predicting things like patients who are at high risk of opioid overdose. We have basic scientists collaborating to look at AI applied to compounds for boosting stroke recovery. We have people who most recently created the Gatortron and Syngatortron clinical language models using natural language processing on over 90 million clinical notes to create the largest clinical language model ever uh, created. We've got people who are taking artificial intelligence solutions back into the ICU and the surgical suites looking at all sorts of interesting solutions there. But where we're really trying to go in terms of data science and AI at UF Health is, is scaling. How do, we, how do we do bigger, more, faster? We want more high impact papers and grants, but of course we also want local and statewide health impact. We want to do more than just write papers and put them on the, on the shelf. We want to do more than just get grants. And it's a couple of the pathways that, that I'm particularly interested in and helping on are getting there through high quality integrated multimodal data, which we can talk about. And then again, safe and sustainable pathways to using AI in practice. We talked earlier about concerns about bias and drift and sustainability and what do these models mean? So I'll give you some thoughts in, in the coming slides on uh, more specifically some of the ways that we think we can get there and, and wants to get there and would love your feedback. Two big things, how are we getting there? How are we getting to that scaling of our impact? One is an increasing emphasis on what I call the first and the last miles. Those are data generation and then implementation science. And then two, a real focus on people, data and technology infrastructure and process improvements so that we can get to the point where we're delivering up data to our research partners, to our researchers in the institution in much more rapid turnaround times, days, not, not months. So what do I mean when I talk about this focus on the first and the last miles? So the first mile in, in my sort of conceptualization of this is, is really about high quality curation of that real world data. So data that are well validated, that are linked across data types and that are standardized. So really pushing on this fair, findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable data that is so that it's ready for AI, ML or, or other 
other analytic methods. And this is very much in line with, for example, the NIH's Bridge to AI program, which is funding work to generate data, generate fair data, as opposed to hypothesis-driven research, the more classic research model. But how do we start with the data and ensure that the data are high quality and ready for data science? And then the last mile is really the fact, reflective of the fact that any solutions we come up with, if they matter, they're going to end with a human in the loop somewhere, right? And so we must put emphasis on implementation and evaluation science so that we understand the impact that these data and these tools are having if we're feeding them back to a clinician, to a patient. And so this is where health services research, implementation science, delivery science, and other disciplines are incredibly important. And so as I think about these sort of three miles, I would propose and happy to discuss that perhaps over the last five, 10 years or so, we've been focused too much on the middle, too much on the accurate modeling, the fancy new AI methods or machine learning methods that have been applied more and more to health data. Not that we shouldn't focus here, but we can't forget the first and the last mile because the old garbage in garbage out adage certainly applies. If we're not bringing high quality data into our modeling work, into our development of data science tools, then it really doesn't matter. And if we're not understanding what impact it ultimately has on human health, then so what? So really a getting to a more focus or at least a balanced focus on these first and last miles is something that we're working hard to do at, at UF. And a lot of this, a lot of the things we think about, again, we don't have time today to dive into all the things that are going on, but a lot of the things that we're thinking about are how do we ensure that there's really strong training, hiring initiatives, rewards, and, and opportunities for scientific advancement on these first and last miles. So as we, as we hire in more and more, quote, AI faculty or faculty who da do data science and AI, how do we give them the support on these first and last miles in terms of high quality data and then the translation of their innovations into practice? So I'll talk a little bit more about how we are improving data services. So in our institution, our enterprise data warehouse for research, we call it the integrated data repository. And our basic goal is providing high quality clinical and operational data for research. We're a mix of people, process, data, and technology. And we're sort of on a never ending sort of process improvement ourselves and continual learning with the goal of making a difference with, with health data. These are some of our people. There's a great team of scientists, researchers, as well as data analysts, data scientists, clinicians, and so when we talk about our people, you know, some of the opportunities and challenges that we're kind of facing today um, are really around the, quote, great resignation, if you will. Um, we are on a kind of nonstop effort to hire data science staff uh, in particular. We've, we're doing a, a really great job at hiring all of those faculty that we talked about, those 100 faculty to the University of Florida. Putting amazing data science and data analyst staff under them has been uh, a, a great challenge and opportunity for us in the last year or so. I think everyone knows coming through and out of hopefully COVID, there's this challenge around the great resignation and it's hitting health and tech really, really hard. And so we've been working to do some of the things proposed in this model about quantifying the scope and the impact of the problem here at UF Health, uh, getting to root causes and then developing tailored programs for recruitment and retention so, uh, so that we can really have a fantastic people foundation uh, for our data services for, for AI and health impact. So our people are, are our most important asset. And then we also have our data and, and technology assets. This is a, a slide that I won't expect you to digest, but this is just a, a cool kind of representation of all of our integrated data repository data assets that have been built over time. We've got a proprietary data model that is our uh, houses our core data that it gets populated every night from our Epic EHR, as well as fed by a lot of other systems. And we, from that data source for research purposes, we do things like use the I2B2 tool. We are increasingly creating OMOP data marts, reusable OMOP data marts that I'll tell you about, and lots of other tools and to create a really strong data and technology infrastructure. So when it comes to the future with our data and our technology infrastructure, what are we doing? What are we working towards? So our vision is really for integration of multimodal data. And we are at varying stages of maturity with all of the different types of data that increasingly researchers are clamoring for. We have a long history 
of being able to serve up and supply structured EHR data out of our health system. These are things like demographics, laboratory results, medications, procedures, diagnoses, all the things that I think as health services researchers and clinical researchers we've used for a long time. We are, again, putting those in through tools like I2B2 for cohort discovery, but we're also increasingly churning out line level data using the OMOP common data model and, and then other customized data sets. So this is a pretty mature path. We're also building out text, imaging, physiologic monitor, genomics, and implementation infrastructure. I told you a little bit about the Gatortron example earlier where we had a fantastic team build the largest clinical language model using over 90 million notes from our integrated data repository. So that pathway is being paved and we're even getting to the point where we have scientists who are creating NLP, innovations, creating structured data out of unstructured data, and we're feeding those back into our clinical data warehouse for research and one day for operations. Our imaging core, increasingly, we are working to wrap, uh, to curate and, and de-identify a robust set of clinical imaging, similarly with physiologic monitoring uh, data that comes off of our bedside monitor and other monitors throughout our health system. And similarly for genomics data, increasingly looking at how do we integrate across all of these data types and provide data services that, again, deliver data to people in, in minutes uh, or days, if not, not, not so much months. So this is really kind of the long-term vision is that we can continue to pave these paths so that we can broker not just structured EHR data, but imaging data, text data, physiologic monitoring data, genomics data, and, and other data types that are important to our research partners. And then perhaps the core that I'm most excited about in our health system is what we call our implementation core. Uh, and this is where we're trying to put together really a pathway and a playbook for research teams who want to translate back into practice. So you built a clinical decision support tool, maybe it uses machine learning, maybe it doesn't, maybe it's something much simpler. What is a safe and sustainable pathway to put those innovations back into practice, to pilot test them, to implement them to disseminate them further if they work and then to de-implement them if they're if they're not working or they just don't make sense uh, for our healthcare organization. So these are the cores and the data and the implementation infrastructure that we are slowly but but surely building out. Uh, in terms of our processes in the uh, integrated data repository, we do a lot of similar things to other CTSA organizations. We consult with our research teams about the UF Health data that we have available for research. We do feasibility and cohort discovery. We do recruitment support uh, using things like our consent to share program, which is a, re a registry, a contact registry for our UF Health patients. And then we provide lots of line level data. As I said, line level data historically in structured format, but increasingly also attaching to that clinical notes, clinical images to support all sorts of interesting data science and, and AI research. Genevieve, I see your, your comments in the chat. Thank you for that. Um, okay, I will definitely want to hit that. I think that'd be an awesome discussion item about the great resignation when we get there. Um, so when it comes to process improvement, we've spent a lot of time thinking about how do we do better in data services? So one of my assistant directors likes to say, you know, no one ever uh, thanks the person who runs the email server. They only complain when it doesn't run well, right? I think anyone who works in data services or IT services kind of knows what that feels like. Uh, and, and to the question about the great resignation and, and challenges in recruitment and retention, this is part of what makes, I think, it a, a challenge for um, retaining and, and, and cultivating development of data scientists and, and data service employees. So one of the things that we've been focusing on at UF is improving, really taking operations management or management science principles and applying them to our data services. Uh, and, I, and I think doing this is going to provide, is providing better service to our research customers. And I think it's making uh, where we work a better place to work. So uh, the management literature talks to us about breaking the trade-off between efficiency and service. And you can think about this from Starbucks to fast food restaurants to any other service process that, that is out there in the world. And they talk about five types of customer introduced variability. These are the types of variability that we as customers or cus bring to any interaction with the service provider. 
arrival request capability effort and subjective preference variability. Um, and a key question in the literature is when these types of these variable variabilities are entered into a service process, what do we do? When do we reduce versus when do we accommodate? So the best way to think about this is, is thinking about this episode of Seinfeld, the no soup for you episode. So if you all recall Seinfeld, and I'm aware, painfully aware that many of you probably do not, the idea here is that when you came to get soup from this restaurant in New York City, if you did not order your soup in exactly the right way, using the right terminology, moving along the line, not asking questions, it was no soup for you, get out of my restaurant. So this is an extreme, a common, uh, a extreme what we call reduction approach to providing services. If you can't get it exactly right, if you're not capable or you don't ask in the right way, no soup for you. Uh, of course, we don't work that way in, in data services, uh, no data for you. Uh, but increasingly, I think we have to, to wrestle with these hard questions of when and how we give data and what types of accommodations we make or don't make uh, for our customers. So let me talk about this a little bit more. What we're doing at, at UF Health with our integrated data repository is we are thinking through this approach. Uh, we're thinking about our data services in, in four different ways. We're thinking about vending machine data, fast food data, chef prepared data, and personal chef data. And this, is, this guides our team members in matching the research requests we get to the appropriate data and tools. So we're trying to take a more proactive approach to serving up data to research teams and slotting them into different types of, four different types of services. So very loosely speaking, we think about, um, um, as we go up this chain from vending machines to fast foods to custom chef to personal chef uh, data, impact is potentially much, much higher as we go up from one to the other, but the cost per project on average also gets much higher. So we have to take that into consideration when we're thinking about how we deliver data to people and how we build out these services. So one of the really cool things that we've been trying to do at UF over the last couple of years is creating more vending machine type data. We have pre-IRB approved reusable data sets, one for COVID-19 and one for cancer. And we're actually have in the works a, a reusable data set that will cover our entire integrated data repository. So over a million patients. These data sets are pre-IRB approved, as I said, so that any researcher in our health system can come and access these data without their own study specific IRB and, and they can have at it in terms of their research questions. So this is an example of moving down this chain away from custom data sets for everyone to more and more, uh, more and more vending machine type uh, data services. So I see a question in the chat that's fairly easy to answer. Um, these data are updated roughly quarterly uh, in current form, and, and we're looking at ways to update them even more frequently. And they don't require additional approval. They're just automatically released to anyone who already has access. Uh, another big thing that we're doing to really help these vending machines take off is to try to raise the capability of our community of, of researchers at the University of Florida. So we are training people, and looking at ways to train people and develop people in the OMOP common data model. Uh, we're, we're strong believers in the OMOP common data model, standardizing data formats uh, so that we're not, historically we've brokered in, in far too many customized data sets and it's, it's simply not a sustainable pathway. So we are looking at more and more common data model approaches, more and more common tools and computing environments so that we can train up our community to use these data uh, in their research. And, and ultimately what this, part of what this does is it lowers the cost of delivering data to, to trainees, to junior faculty, not only are there, are there research benefits to this approach, but there's lots and lots of uh, education and training benefits as well. So the other thing that we're working hard to do is go in the other direction uh, for some of our research teams in our data services. So we are really working hard to formalize what we call our personal chef partnerships uh, between our IDR and our research teams. So we have historically operated um, probably a little bit more in the, the customer service model instead of the partnership model, where research teams come to IDR, come to IT and say, give me data and we try to give them what they ask for. More and more what we're trying to do is, is create shared risk and shared benefits 
uh, and break down those silos between research teams and the data service operation. Uh, you know, we have teams who are cut, uh, doing cutting edge work, really pressing the envelope on AI and machine learning using real world health data. And, and we need them side by side with our data analysts, side by side with the people who are curating our data so that we can ensure the high quality of our data um, and, and we can have a more of a partnership interaction. Uh, this also allows us to create data pipelines that, that feed over time so that ultimately uh, we are not doing one-off data requests. We're really trying to get away from the one-off customized data requests and, and create more sustainable pipelines uh, for all sorts of our multimodal data. And that's really sort of that longer term vision sort of wrapped together with our approach here. Um, I believe with strong partnerships across our, our expert research teams and our IT organization, this is how we pave this path to all of these cores that we're talking about so that we can deliver imaging data, physiologic monitor data, genomics data, and ultimately implementation into practice over time. So these are some of the, the, the more micro questions that we think about a lot is how do we build a community of savvy data scientists users? How do we better co-locate our data with our tools for artificial intelligence and machine learning? This is a great area for great opportunity for doing better at our organization so that it's not just here's your data, good luck and Godspeed. It's uh, here's your data in an environment where you can maximize the value, uh, the analytic value from them. Uh, again, these questions that I mentioned in the using the soup the, the soup analogy, how do we purposefully accommodate and how do we purposefully reduce when we as data service providers uh, can easily get overwhelmed with the massive demand for data? Uh, what are the expectations of our research teams uh, when they come for data so that it's not purely a pull model where we just try to keep up? And then how do we build community is another huge question. I know at, at UF as we're growing by leaps and bounds in terms of the number of faculty who do data science, and, and AI research with health data, how do we build community across both the faculty and the staff? Um, part of what we're seeing with the, this interesting kind of uh, phenomena around the great resignation and uh, with IT and data science staff members, um, they're getting paid increasingly more. They're demanding things like full remote work. And, and so the, some of the traditional academic hierarchies, uh, faculty versus staff, which aren't very uh, useful in the first place, uh, they're really being challenged. And so how do we build the appropriate community and, and foster development of not just our faculty members, but our staff members? So those are some of the, the things that we're thinking about. Uh, these are some of the discussion questions that, that Brian shared and I kind of uh, adapted. And I'm gonna stop and take a breath and uh, Love to hear your questions and love to discuss. Thank you, Chris, for taking a pause. Um, I have posted a response uh, from our transcript feature to Samantha Alk's question. Um, did my best there to try to get the essence in there, but Yes, please use the Q&A or the raise your hand feature. We'll wait for questions. So I see a question from uh, Rubina uh, about planning to integrate data from other organizations in the vending machine type data. Would love that. And we are hopeful any day to that uh, one of our research teams will be receive one of the Bridge to AI awards from the NIH. And I think this is a great opportunity to do more of that. Uh, because that award would be a collaboration on over a dozen organizations. And I think there's lots of uh, interesting ways that, that to, and, and frankly, it's the mandate from the NIH that those data sets be made easily and widely available and integrated across institutions. Um, so Genevieve, your uh, question about the great resignation. Um, I'd love to hear more about your experiences. Uh, this is a uh, in really incredible phenomenon that seems to be going on. And when, whoever else I talk to around the country, everyone's facing it. It is um, our data science and our IT staff, uh, you know, salaries are jumping by leaps and bounds. Uh, full remote work is increasingly commonplace. And I don't know that we're ever going to fully compete with, with industry 
I think we still are going to sell the academic mission and, and, and hopefully that is, has some value for people, but we are looking, I mean, we are rapidly looking at increased pay. Uh, we've, we've already shifted towards much more hybrid models than we did two years ago um, and full remote may or may not be right around the corner and, and as an option, sort of a, a routine option. Um, and then, as I said earlier, I think it, it's probably time that our data analyst staff and our IT staff, uh, frankly, I think they need more opportunities for professional development. I think we need to be thinking about ways that we really embrace the value that they're adding to our organizations because it's a great value and the market is now speaking. And I think historically, especially in some academic institutions, the approach is, you know, it's out of sight, out of mind, um, give us our data and, and then I'll talk to you when I need more data. I, I don't think we can afford that. I think we need to figure out more and more ways for those people to, to foster an environment where it's a great place to, to work in a, in a data services or an IT organization. Dr. Harley, I have a question from Chris Tignanelli. Uh, it's a two-part question, so I'll do my best here. Um, part one, Dr. Harley, UMN and UF, Gainesville, and a few other institutions have an active partnership using federated learning methods to train generalizable AI models and facilitate external validation. As you mentioned, and we're experienced firsthand, and we experienced firsthand, one of the big issues we uncovered is that each institution has its own data infrastructure, some more mature than others. To remedy this, we're all in the early stages of writing a U infrastructure grant for a 2023 submission, specifically around a shared model for an EHR RWD data infrastructure to fuel AI research. I'm curious your thoughts on what the ideal data infrastructure of the future would look like. And then there's a bit more. I'm, I can read on, but maybe we'll, the questionnaire to focus it. Curious your thoughts on what the ideal data infrastructure of the future would look like. Yeah, no, thank you, for, Brian, for reading that. Thank you, Chris, for the question. It's a, it's a huge question. And I think uh, with the Bridge to AI Awards, we're gonna, and, and other awards like that you're talking about writing, I think we're going to, we're going to be defining what that looks like and we're going to be learning what works and what doesn't work. Um, I do think it's integrated multimodal data. I think it is structured data, it is images, it is text. I think the federated learning approaches are exciting for the potential uh, they have to overcome some of the privacy and security challenges, which um, I, I know are foremost uh, top of mind in our organization today. Um, in our IT organization, it must be the same at Minnesota. We are regularly asked sometimes for research, sometimes for operations, you know, from vendors, you know, send us all your EHR data uh, for some new AI solution. Um, and so those are, those are introduce huge new questions for our security and the privacy people. So I think federated learning approaches are something that you know, we've talked about with you all and, and have talked about in other contexts uh, as potentially ways to, to keep our data safer while still um, making data accessible for, for innovation. Um, you ask how do smaller non-university health systems participate that don't have infrastructure? I think we have to find ways to resource the infrastructure first and foremost. I think many people in the informatics community will, you know, have been feeling this pain for many, many years, uh, that the infrastructure is not necessarily what's resourced first. And so being having the opportunity for funding infrastructure is, is critically important. And, and things like Bridge the AI, I think are hopefully gonna help with some of that. And if, if those sort of entities and funders can hold us accountable to uh, bringing, hold us accountable to representation of large, small, urban, rural, um, under-resourced, underserved areas and health systems that are in those, that would be fantastic. Uh, as you know, those, those systems are not, that, that they tend to have uh, less IT infrastructure to start with. Um, so I think these are all um, really important things that we've got to figure out. 
Yeah, that's one of the things that we're struggling with. Like right now, all the institutions that are actively engaged are big academic institutions and have huge IT divisions. But we've been talking to some smaller, more rural health systems so that we have more generalizable data. We can train you know, better models and they just don't have the resources to do this. So the question is writing grants or maybe seeing if there's industry solutions that can help bridge this gap or, or there's a way that our system can help theirs out. But that's a, something that we're actively struggling with right now. Yeah, I think there's probably lessons to be learned from things like PCORnet, uh, where and I know we see that as we also have a, a PCORnet clinical data research network that's uh, led out of University of Florida. It's called One Florida Plus, and you see very different um, levels of engagement and different types of challenges with our large versus our small partners that contribute data to to One Florida, and. <clears throat> I, I think some of these, again, the federated approaches are, are really interesting. I'm not an expert in that space. Um, I think if we can get to the point where we can use our, our really smart people to develop appliance-like infrastructure, right? So if, if our academic health centers can create appliance-like infrastructure for federated learning that can be distributed out to some of these smaller systems, um, I think there's, there's great potential there. Uh, we have a question also from Julia Hennigan. Uh, apologies if I'm saying your name uh, incorrectly, Julia. The question was, how do you think about the inclusion of specific populations, for example, pediatrics, when considering the organization of data science infrastructure across a health system? Thanks, Julia. Yeah, thanks. This is a great question. So we for example, pediatrics, right? I mean, we our overall data infrastructure is broadly inclusive, our integrated data repository of all of our populations. One of the things that we've started to doing, and it's in this vein of these custom chef partnerships that I talked about, is, is really starting to cultivate relationships with key uh, faculty across specific departments or divisions, and pediatrics is one of them. We're talking about, for example, right now about sort of a maternal and child health data mart, you know, sub uh, warehouse out of our integrated data repository. Um, what it really takes to do that right is active and ongoing engagement uh, with the, the clinical and the clinical research experts from those units um, with, with IT. And, and then so what that takes is it the right incentives and the right time and effort from people with the varying skill sets such that we can build out data that appropriately reflect um, those specific populations. Uh, so we've, uh, we're really trying to push increasingly on a, what we call a clinical data translators. These are people with clinical knowledge, clinical expertise who are deep in the data with our data science and our IT uh, staff and faculty. Uh, these clinical data translators, these are the people who know what happens in the health system day to day. These are people that understand clinical process, say for children, uh, say for maternal health, um, and finding ways in the organization to incentivize those people to be part of the infrastructure, to be part of the service processes, not to just consumers of data. Uh, so we're, 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 we're in the very early stages of talking about ways to do this in maternal and child health. Uh, we're doing it pretty actively with the cancer center. Uh, uh, with people who are clinical data translators or clinical experts in cancer and cancer informatics. And we already, we've been, we have our probably longest history of doing this is with our critical care, uh, some of our critical care team members. But I think it's, um, I, th I think it's just fundamentally important that you get enough buy-in and investment and real partnership uh, from the clinicians and the clinical teams in these areas. Um, again, juxtaposing that with the, just give us the data, give us the data faster. Um, we have to build the data infrastructure together first. Thank you, Dr. Harley. The next question, Steve Johnson. 
Excellent presentation. Focusing on the first and last miles is a good analogy and very important. But capturing additional data slash fixing data quality and implementing models is much, much harder than just building models and publishing papers. That's why researchers mostly work on models instead of dealing with first or last mile projects. They can finish their study and get it published. What recommendations do you have for putting in more infrastructure and capability for the first and last miles? For example, what services are you providing in your implementation core? Thanks, Steve, for the question. Yeah, thank you, Steve, very much for that question. And I think it's uh, somewhat related to, to Tim Beebe's question uh, earlier about recruiting implementation scientists. And so one thing we are working to do is to hire more implementation scientists. We've not been super successful in doing that under that larger AI push, but we have a division of implementation science uh, that is co-located in the department with our biomedical informatics group, which is a, is a, is a cool uh, organizational structure and we are through other sources, uh, using other resources, trying to build out our hiring of faculty and staff who do implementation science. So that's one start uh, for our implementation core. We are also in the early stages of developing what we call kind of our playbook uh, for IT integration in UF Health. This is in really in response to the to the um, increased demand for implementation project, people who want to integrate an app with, with Epic essentially. And there's more and more research funding for doing these kinds of things. And, there's, um, and it really drives home this divide between an operational IT organization and a research team that's good at writing grants and, and good at getting papers. Uh, so what we're trying to do is, is put together sort of a playbook process um, and set of policies around step-by-step, step, what are the expectations if your tool is gonna to go from a paper, a model that's in a paper to some sort of proof of concept, minimum viable product uh, that gets validated and then hopefully implemented and sustained over time in our health system. So, because quite often what we find is that we're just talking past one another in IT versus in research because we, we have very, very different incentives and very, very different day-to-day -day, um, work. And so trying to bridge that gap, both with this sort of playbook that's gonna set expectations for how we interact with the IT organization if we're a set of data scientists or a set of implementation scientists and how the IT organization is gonna work with our researchers because research is one of our uh, core missions and that includes uh, doing implementations. So the playbook is there and then we're hiring people to sort of work in bridging roles. This is kind of like the clinical data translator that I spoke about we are more and more trying to hire people who are hybridized in their, uh, in sort of a traditional faculty role. I do research, I write papers with, I do IT or I do data science for the health system. So my job is an embodiment of that, a CRIO. I have a 50% faculty appointment and I do research. I lead a research program. I write grants, I write papers. And then I am a 50% CRIO, which means I work day to day with our IT organization, the people who build our data infrastructure, who deliver data, and our people who run Epic, uh, build new things in Epic, integrate new, new, new tools in Epic. And it's, um, it's a bit maddening <laughs> of, a, of a dual role at sometimes, but I think it's important. I think we have to have people who, who see both sides and are incentivized and rewarded for seeing both sides and, and bringing them closer together. So we're doing that with some other faculty where they're having a 20% or a 30% meaningful role to the data and IT service organizations um, and they're, they're rewarded accordingly. Thank you, Dr. Harley. Uh, a question that's been in the Q&A for a for some time here from Samantha. Can non-UF faculty and staff access the data, i.e. community health workers interested in research? Thanks, thanks, Samantha. Yeah, so <clears throat> right now only in partnership with other UF researchers. Um, we've not delivered data out um, broad, more, more broadly than, than the organization, although 
you know, many of our faculty and staff will be collaborating with other organizations or community workers. So I see Tim's question and then I see one from Genevieve. Tim, to your question about um, the point of tenure, we, we're, not, we're not there yet. Um, what <clears throat> we've tried to design these people's positions. So, so for some are non-tenure track and I think can do very well from a professional development and uh, rewards in other ways, but they're non-tenure track. So if that's what they wanna do, <clears throat> It's a bit of a different model than a, than a tenure track faculty. Uh, we have some tenure track faculty who are on this model. And it, again, it's, um, um, it's an interesting balance. So we just hired someone, for example, where we're really looking hard at um, synergies between her service role in IT and her, her scholarship role and her teaching role. So we're trying to look for dual wins in if, if she's training people in the OMOP common data model, that should be counting for promotion and tenure for education. Um, if she's helping improve research informatics service processes, uh, she should be publishing on that. We should be publishing together on that. And then we should be going after infrastructure like grants, like Chris mentioned earlier. Um, I think we have to get those synergies if those dual faculty are going to be tenure track. Yeah, just following up on that real quick, Chris. Um, you know, the challenge is sometimes in, in the academy, there's a very myopic focus on, you know, our, you know, PI ship on RO, NIH R01s as kind of the, the, you know, the standard. And, you know, bringing in industry funding or support from the health system, from my perspective, all dollars are green. And, but, um, you know, that's not necessarily the ethos or the zeitgeist that, the academy has and, and we're trying to navigate for these embedded scholars that have a different sort of funding uh distribution or of a different phenotype you know making their way through this sort of standard um set of criteria you know we're trying to change the criteria to value and incent team science and engagement and those things but i think we have a ways to go and um you know there's one thing to attract faculty to this but it's trying to retain them and then advance in their careers that is going to be a challenge for those of us, those of us working in this space. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Uh, you know, I also come from a health service research, health policy and management background. And I think w historically we're, f we're more inclusive in terms of all dollars are green and, and find other ways besides NIH. Um, and, and, but, at, U, at UF, in terms of our promotion and tenure guidelines, we do in our College of Medicine have a team science track. Um, although I think even the first test case on that was someone who had, you know, PI'd R01s. Um, so I still think the rubber is going to have to meet the road on um, what does team science look like to promotion and tenure committees. Uh, we do a lot here of multiple PI'd grants um, as a way, as one small way. Um, small, but I think meaningful way to um, spread the, the the PI wealth, and I think that's well respected by our promotion and tenure committee. So that's good to see. Um, yeah, we just have a few minutes left. There was a question from Genevieve. There was a part two question from Chris Tignanelli, and Mike Usher had a question. If you maybe could touch on those, thanks, Dr. Harley. Yeah, Genevieve, so thanks for the, the question about structuring the AI initiative. So this um, was driven out of the provost office and then we sort of carved out um, a UF health specific, our academic health center initiative. It was, it was pretty centralized from a hiring perspective. These are seven deans and, and their boss and our senior vice president for health affairs collaborating together with a central steering committee, which I was actually co-leading. Uh, so we're 18 months in now to a steering committee with three domain specific search committees that have processed, you know, hundreds of applications and ultimately hired 26 people. So very centralized, uh, which is not fast, uh, as, as you can imagine, um, but it's been fairly, um, it's been relatively uh, ecumenical uh, and, and we've been successful in getting faculty into all of our different colleges in our health system because of that. It, we've 
minimized or we've reduced the amount of internal competition that would have happened otherwise had we just said, you know, handed a couple lines to these departments and a couple lines to these departments and a couple lines to these departments. Because the, the um, from the provost's office, the goal was spread data science and AI throughout the university. This is not just one department or one institute. Um, now, what has lagged behind our hiring initiative, and we're, we're trying to, in some ways, play catch up, is the infrastructure to support those people, staff, uh, the data and the IT, the things that, that I spoke about. Um, and I'm happy to talk to you more about, about the, the nitty gritty of a lot of that, uh, what our experience has been. And I'm trying to get to Mike Usher's question here as well. Yeah, so this is a really interesting one that uh, I'll just say, this is a really interesting one. Um, we pre-process and clean up research data and then uh, people create a model or create a data science tool. Then they come back to the health system and say, oh yeah, can I implement that into a decision support tool? Um, and then we have to unravel all of the cleaning and pre-processing or, or post-processing that happened uh, when the data came out. So yes, uh, thinking about those things a lot is a, it's a, it's a whole nother animal when you try to put it back into practice. Well, we are unfortunately right at time. Perhaps, uh, Dr. Harley, you, you would be open to responding um, to Dr. Tignanelli's uh, part two question. Um, and then slides, would you be open to sharing your slide deck with our audience? If we could post that on our website for everyone. Yeah, happy to, to share my slides. Well, it really feels like eating and running here, everybody. <laughs> uh, this really concludes our first uh, impact seminar. Thank you so much for all those that are attending. Sorry if you experienced any issues with the invites uh, at the last moment there. A nice virtual hand for all the questions and for Dr. Harley. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. And we will see you next month here, August 2nd for our second seminar. Bye for now.